Um, our next speaker um, is also, uh, and I'm, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say an icon of intersectionality. Um, Watko uh, is a, uh, a Nahuatl, anti-speciesist, queer activist, que uh, queer and indigenous activist and community organizer. He comes from um, the beautiful city of Monterrey in Mexico. Uh, we have another delegate from that city, Estela Torres, is also from Monterrey. I haven't been there. They tell me it's beautiful, so that's why I'm saying that. Um, Watko has worked um, for um, three decades um, in uh, the pursuit of an intersectional politics that uh, raises uh, the dignity of uh, indigenous people, queer people, uh, and animals in the environment altogether. Um, He's worked uh, as a uh, coordinator of volunteers in the mountains of um, central Mexico, uh, helping indigenous, uh, uh, people, uh, indigenous people running coffee plantations. Um, he uh, uh, is the um, founder of Faunaxion, Faunaxion um, in uh, uh, the city of Mexico. Um, and that group is uh, a group uh, pursuing food justice and education. And uh, one of the things that Watko is going to talk to us about um, is um, Faunaxion's um, El Mocajete project, um, which is a food truck um, that uh, is, goes on the streets and pursues food justice uh, and education. And so uh, I'll stop talking. Please uh, welcome Watko. Well, thank you so much, Philip, for the introduction. Uh, I am very, very honored and privileged to be here today. Um, I'm thanking uh, the uh, Austral Asian Animal Studies Association for this wonderful and important conference, very important topic. Uh, I'm thanking uh, Annie Potts, Dr. Annie Potts, for all her effort, all she has helped and her team to get me here. And, um, you know, um, I think it's very important to uh, bring activists and people that are not scholars to these kind of conferences. Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to try to talk to you about intersectionality and about the colonization um, on my own experience. You know, it's, it's hard for me and disempowering at the same time to decolonize myself and think about all these issues and resist because we are still experiencing all the impacts of colonization. Um, so it has been a, like a, a little bit of a roller coaster. I um, reflect on these issues for an upcoming book that uh, um, is, is going to be out in November, and the book is called Veganism, Sex, and Politics, Tales of Danger and Pleasure by Lou Hamilton. And uh, this, I'm going to read this from that book, and I hope that uh, this illustrates for you the, the intersections of, um, you know, animal rights, anti-specism, veganism, um, reclamation of identity, class, uh, queer issues, etc. So I'm going to read from here, and um, I'm going to do some comments also. Um, so I'm very excited about this book. Uh, and uh, he's also going to talk about uh, our project, El Molcajete. So I'm very excited. And uh, so um, I'm going to start reading. Um, I was born in the northern Mexican city of Monterrey. My father, Jose Tristan, an indigenous man from the Nahuatl people, emigrated from the city of Real de Catorce in central Mexico looking to improve his own and his family's fortunes. There he met Guadalupe Alvarado, who would become his wife and my mother. Um, this is not very good light, I'm sorry. <laughs> and my mother. Jose worked, worked on a number of odd jobs until his um, big break a position on, at the nylon plant in Monterrey, where he would become one of the union leaders who led a successful strike. Um, this was one of the uh, biggest strikes in northern Mexico, uh, in the city of Monterrey. And after that, uh, 
many of the unions were uh, dismantled uh, and my father was uh, blacklisted. And so some years later, Nylon put my father on a blacklist. Uh, for her part, my mother was the leader of an important land occupation movement out of which grew the Canteras neighborhood where I was born. Um, the occupation was severely repressed by the state. Thank you so much. And my mother was in prison for two months. Uh, during that time, the woman of the neighborhood looked after me and breastfed me collectively. So my mother um, led that occupation and I was born in that uh, place that they occupied. And then she went to prison when I was born. And so I was breastfed by all the women. And uh, so they were all like my mothers growing up there. And uh, so um, looking back, I, I understand now my father and his efforts to, uh, you know, make sure that we learn Spanish and that we get an education and never talk about, you know, who we were and where we come from as indigenous people because he didn't want it for us to, to experience the same things that he experienced in Monterrey coming. Uh, my happiest memories are of the kitchen, surrounded by the smell of freshly made tortillas, the sounds of the mortar and pestle, and the stories of my mother and sisters. My father and my brothers tried to get me out of the, the kitchen so I didn't turn into a joto, a fag. But there I stay until I was nine years old. That's where I learned to read and write and improve my Spanish. That's also where I learned that I liked the long hair and makeup my sisters wore. And I loved going with my mother on her daily rounds to feed the dogs, cats, horses, and donkeys in the neighborhood. That's where my mother instilled in me respect for all animals. So yeah, I, looking back, um, you know, I flourished in the kitchen and I also start to, you know, write and um, write poetry a little bit and, and did, um, you know, discover that I like dance and I was dreaming to be a dancer in the kitchen. And uh, that was a very safe space for me. And, uh, you know, looking back, I think that uh, it was uh, really a space that saved me because in low-class neighborhoods in Mexico, um, especially in those years, it was deadly to be a queer kid. You know, you could be killed. And many of my friends in that neighborhood where they are killed. No? So I think that it was literally a very, very safe space and that's, thank you that I was there until nine years old, I'm alive. In those years, the only information I got about my cultural identity came from the food cooked by the woman in the neighborhood. Nixtamal and tortillas, cactus, chiles, chayotes, quelites, black beans, mushrooms. The people who cooked the same dishes with the same ingredients as we did were also Nahuatl people, many of them from the same village or area as my father. So my father didn't talk to us and he didn't want to us to ask, especially me, I asked too, much, too many questions about that. But I talked and asked questions to the neighbors that cooked the same food and they also remember some stories that were common stories in the area where my father grew up and they knew my, my family. So now I know that they were all like, you know, related, they were now old people. And I got my, you know, part of my identity from all those foods that I share with other people. <clears throat> so, um, you know, like uh, those years, I remember that, um, you know, we eat those foods that I just mentioned. And uh, like, I remember vividly when TV came to my neighborhood in black and white, and we all had to pay like one cent to go to see um, the shows on somebody's TV in the neighborhood. And uh, I remember how the food started to change around the neighborhood, you know, and people start to eat bread, like this white bread. And, um, you know, 
I remember when I ate that bread, I, it was disgusting, you know, for me. I didn't like it, and it was like all stick on my tongue. And <laughs> so I didn't like it at all. I remember also that, I always remember right now that we had a Christmas where all my sisters started to work in the city. And um, they, instead of having tamales, they brought like turkey, you know. And people took like these pictures with the old camera with the little cube with the, with the turkey because it was very nice. And nobody touched the turkey. Everybody went to eat the tamales in the kitchen. <laughs> and I think the dogs in the neighborhood got the turkey because nobody liked the turkey. So <laughs> when I was... Um, 11, mm. when I was seven, my father, out of work, after being blacklisted, uh, uh, he brought a pig home. It was my job to care for, for that pig. Some months later, the pig gave birth to 12 piglets, whom I adore. I played with them and took them to, for walks. But when the piglets turned four months old, a van came for them. I protested and struggled, but they were taken away. I was inconsolable. That event earned me the reputation of a famous Joto who cried for pigs. That's when the harassment started um, at school. I went back to the kitchen, the only place I felt safe, happy, and at peace. There I did my first three years of school. So I was pulled out of the school because all this uh, harassment of the kids. Uh, because I, I, I cry for, for, for those pigs a lot. And just girls cry, right? So um, I had the tag of being a fag. Um, but when I turned nine, my father and brothers finally succeed in getting me out of the kitchen. Going back to school was brutal. They made uh, fun of me in the schoolyard because I never eat meat or hamburgers or sandwiches, only tortillas. The other kids bullied me, calling me Joto, an Indian. Uh, what else can a dirty Indian eat? Bean headed. He has a cactus on his forehead. And I quickly realized that if I wanted to survive, I would need to change my image and learn to act as a good Mexican and a macho. By the time I turned 10, I was totally accepted by the badass kids. I stayed that road until I was 27 years old. And uh, one of the things that helped me most uh, is like, you know, bond with them, eating those foods that they eat, you know. Um, so anything that relates to being Indian, um, you know, is not w well seen or being like, you know, um, showing affection or showing uh, sentiment. So I learned very well and performed, you know, on those years to survive and uh, never look back. So I live my life like that. And um, on January 1994, news broke that the Zapatista National Liberation Army ZLN had sites part of the state of Chiapas in southern Mexico. The Zapatistas presented a series of demands for autonomy, self-government, and recognition. This was the same day that NAFTA, the free trade agreement between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, came into force. The Zapatista struggle became a pioneer in the global anti-capitalist movement. The words of su comandante Marcos, the Zapatista spokesperson, resonated strongly with me. If you want to know who is behind these baklavas, just look at the mirror. I felt the urgent need to go to Chiapas. <clears throat> so, you know, I uh, plead with my mom and, and try to get money from people that I know to go to Chiapas to, to join the Zapatistas. Um, arrived at the city of San Cristobal de las Casas on February 1994 to support the peace belt. After the conversations, uh, well, the peace belt was, uh, you know, literally a, a belt of people, you know, that was like surrounding uh, the main cathedral where the conversations between the uh, federal government and Zapatistas 
were taking place. So I participated on that or, or organization. It was like a huge undertake and you know a lot of logistics to keep 24/7 people around the the cathedral there. Um, after the conversations between the Zapatistas and the Mexican government in late February and early March, I decided to stay and join the movement to support indigenous communities fighting for their rights. The first visit we made to the communities um, followed a wildfire. Once we got permission to go to, uh, we discovered that three of the villages have been destroyed. The scene was heartbreaking. Arriving at one of the remaining villages, we encounter more heartbreak. Exhausted uh, women and children being cared for after fighting the flames for two days with shovels, buckets, and bare hands. I spoke to a woman with four children. She told me that they had lost their house and were staying with their mother, with her mother, while the the shack was revealed. Um, I say I didn't know what to say. It was like re really hard for me to have this conversation. But I managed. I said to the woman that I was sorry, and I offered to help in the construction of reconstruction of her house. Mm, this was her reply. Um, I feel sad about losing the shack, but I am so happy that the fire stopped it before it reached the place where the birds live. They are more important to me than the house. I don't know what I would do, what I have done if the fire had reached them. At the time, I didn't understand her response, but it left me speechless. After the conversation, I wouldn't be the same again. So. Um, you know, I just um, telling this little story to to uh, illustrate um, you know intersections, and I think it's it's been um, illustrated. And here um, to close this, the, the events I share led me to rediscover myself as indigenous Nahuatl, a queer, and allied for animals. The smell of freshly made tortillas have returned to my kitchen. Along with many memories, I'm happy and proud to share this food and stories with my friends and family. And I'm going to quote again, just like Terry, Rigoberta Menchu, Nobel Prize. And she say, um, I understand now her words when she say, we only trust people who eat the same food that we eat. And so... I'm going to talk a little bit about El Molcajete because uh, I've been out of Mexico for 13 years. I've been in the diaspora in the United States. And um, I've always been in contact with Mexico. And since uh, this event happened, I've been in a journey, you know, to reclaim my own identity uh, as indigenous, but also as a queer person. And um, I, it's, it's important for me to, to be connected to Mexico. I was, um, you know, trying to help in many different ways, but it was limited because I was in the United States with not a very, you know, regular uh, legal situation. And uh, once, you know, I worked through that, um, I it was easier for me to do more things, and I create uh, with other people this group called Faunaxion, and uh, we mainly try to, um, you know, empower activists in Mexico, providing uh, relevant tools for them. And we have been focusing on, on a lot of food activism. You know, we started in uh, 2015, and uh, in 2016, we work on a, our first project in conjunction with the Secretary of Education, which is a, you know, very big um, uh, institution, government institution in Mexico. And so we were very excited. We create a, a, a recipe little cookbook with them and they print it and uh, you know since then I, I, I've been more like interested in trying to do more so in 2017 we run this like trail project called El Moncajete which means the mortar where we make food you know and uh, it's, a, it's an indigenous um, uh, tool that from Aztecs from my tribe and um, 
El Mocajete basically tried to like, uh, you know, open up spaces to create conversations about food. And to, we hope that we empower people and uh, by, you know, giving their own food and showcasing their own food and staples. And, uh, you know, in those six months that we run this trail, we saw a lot of uh, uh, really good response from, from the communities we went. People were very happy and proud, you know, and they were like a little bit surprised that we were, you know, taking any interest on, on, on those foods. And people were very happy to share recipes with their community and talk about, you know, many issues. They, they, they talk about health and their foods, how good they are for them and how accessible they are for them and how many you know, stories that they can tell when they cook certain foods, etc. So it was really, really um, great. So we decided to, to uh, make it permanent. And last year we got a grant and we bought a, a food truck. And so we started the project. And I'm going to show you some pictures of Del Molcajete. And I hope that I, I'm very bad for technology. So <laughs> thank you for helping me. But this is um, the food truck. I don't know if you can see it because it's a little light. Steve, could we dim the lights a little bit, please? This is a brand new truck that we got uh, four months ago. And we did this uh, mural, you know, also it's an educational mural. And uh, one side talks about like all these uh, mythology and Aztec foods and Aztec gods and different food staples. Is that the other side that you cannot see here? And this side has um, like a, our vision of food and utopia. And you have these indigenous kids sharing food with these animals. Is that like a, you cannot see it there, but it's a, like a picnic. You know, all of them are sharing food. The pig and the, the two kids and the little cow. And we have the sacred corn too on top there. And, uh, you know, the, feature, uh, the picture features uh, the coordinators of El Marcajete, who are, like, amazing. Mariana and Jorge, they are from uh, Tlaxcala, which is the most um, important area in Mexico for food, where all the Mexican food come from, you know, culturally. And so uh, they're amazing. We are very happy to have them there. And can we change that? This is um, outside their house in Tlaxcala State. And so we basically uh, try to go around and have like food demos, share food with people. If people, you know, wanted to talk about something or want us to give a presentation on different things, we can do that too. Uh, we've been going out for three months now and the response has been like really amazing. So, you know, we're going to take the project to whatever the communities that ask for us to go one us to, you know. So this is one uh, food um, sampling that they did in a community. And Tlaxcala is the, you know, historically the most important area for, for Mexican food, culinary, but it's also a very poor area uh, and very forgotten. So this, yeah, to try another one with the, maybe keep going. So. Uh, this is another other part of, uh, yeah, yeah. This is the other part of the mural. That is really nice. Uh, that's what I was telling you. Like one side is like the prehistory of food and, you know, all, all these uh, mythologies of the Aztecs and their foods and their seeds. It's really nice. It's very colorful too. And so we go around in central Mexico uh, not just in Tlaxcala, but other states where are like uh, mainly indigenous people, different people like uh, Hidalgo, Puebla, and Mexico City. Those states. See, keep going. Oops. Oh. This is a visit to a kindergarten there in, Tla in Tlaxcala State too. You can you can show one with the kids that are so cute. Yeah. 
So they, they cook with the kids, and the kids had a lot of fun there. But anyways, there we were just talking to the families and mothers and fathers. Um, uh, I, you know, I like to cook and talk about many things when I'm cooking and sharing food with people. And so this is, this is a, a Molcajete project, but, you know, we're saying that, you know, we have four programs right now. We have uh, the food, food demos with the recipes that the people um, donate of, of Oaxaca, and they uh, agree to, to share with everybody. And uh, we have some presentations, too, about health and food because that area has been impacted by fast food from the United States and it's a lot of like you know issues uh, with that and so we have this presentation too and um, we also go to events and support and cook for them and give, give food for free that's another uh, program um, and people has been talking about like trying to like also partner and uh, share some some of the seeds that people have in this area to grow different foods. So maybe we, we're also gonna go on that. So now maybe I'm gonna just like end up this talk and um, I'm looking forward for your question, talking to you after this too. Um, with the video that I make in my house, uh, me cooking the main uh, staples, the main foods of the Aztec people, which are uh, the cactus and um, uh, mushrooms, tortillas, obviously and no, no palace. So I'm gonna end it up with that video. Thank you. Cuando tenga la tierra sembraré las palabras que mi padre Martín Fierro puso al viento. Kia ora friends from New Zealand and excuse my Maori. I, that's the first word I learned. Kiora and I, my name is Gerardo Tristan. Um, I also go by Watco, and I am a Native American Nahuatl. We are activists, food activists uh, from Monterrey, Mexico. Um, I'm very excited uh, to be showing you how to make one of the main dishes and one of the main staples. How to make different things with with corn, which is the uh, main uh, staple in Mexico and is our sacred uh, plant and has sustained, sustained indigenous people for millennia in the Americas. We're going to try to make uh, tortillas, gorditas, and empanadas. Okay, so we're going to start with the tortillas and I hope you like it. This is all very rustic because, you know, we are in Atlanta, Georgia, that's where I live and uh, all our foods are in Mexico and our tools so I'm just trying to improvise here do the best I can um, I did cook four fillings for, for today's uh, gorditas, tortillas and empanadas and I made some um, uh, mole uh, mushrooms and uh, some cactus uh, some very very famous guacamole and beans so we're going to be accompanying the, those foods with these, these fillings. So we'll start, you know, I'm using always this uh, maseca, which is from Mexico, this product. And uh, it's very easy to use maseca because maseca is really good to work with, to make uh, all kinds of things with, with the corn uh, flour. And so I use one cup, you know, um, to make, we're gonna make uh, two or three tortillas with this, and it's very, very easy. So one cup of maseca, and I'm gonna put also one cup of water. Here we go. And now we're going to try to make a paste. So just stir it. We want it to soft, but not that soft. We want it to like, the masa to hold itself. Okay, like, let's see, like this little ball here of masa. So it's consistent enough, it is not breaking, so it, doesn't, it means it doesn't need more water. And I'm going to be uh, trying to make a food uh, tortilla presser with the, the plastic bag and with these cutting boards that I have like this, ok? 
Okay, so this is not very circular, but you got the point. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to use it as a part of the presser. And you see uh, now it's a little bit dry, so it dries really fast. And so I'm going to put it in the center of this plastic and cover with the other part of the plastic top. And I'm going to use this as my presser. So I'm going to press like this gently all the way down and evenly. Okay, so we have the tortilla here and it's ready to be cooked. Okay, so it's very very easy. I'm going to make a smaller version of the tortilla and more uh, thick and we call that gordita. And I just press it, press very, very, very kindly and not too much. And I make a small tortilla, okay? And this is what we call gordita, okay? Uh, this is a little bit different because this is like a food that you can bring. It's a, a like a pocket, you know, so you can uh, open it. You'll see later on and then put the food inside. Now I'm going to make um, the last thing is called... Uh, Empanada, you know the empanadas I guess from Argentina, but in Mexico we do have corn empanadas. They are usually fried, so it's, it's a you know comfort food, not super healthy, but people love it. I love it too. So we do the same, always the same procedure, and we're gonna do it as if we're gonna do a tortilla. So we we'll push all the way down evenly. We get it ready, nice and round. And uh, we put the filling. So let's make one with uh, champignones. See, champignones with mole. These are uh, uh, portobello mushrooms and white mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms. So I'll put some and I put a little bit of nopales which is the very famous cactus that we eat in Mexico and it has an acquired taste, but we love it. These are very simple and they just boil and that's it. Put salt and uh, chiles, hot spices and uh, onions, that's it. So, and here it is. It's not perfect, but this is the first panada that I made. Cuando tenga la tierra, te lo juro semilla que la vida será un dulce racimo y en el mar de las uvas nuestro vino. We wait for the tortilla and the gordita to, to be done. Um, I'm gonna make some salsa for us. And this is a, a very traditional instrument in Mexican cooking and indigenous cooking, most from the center of Mexico, from Tlaxcala and uh, Mexico State, Mexico City, that area. And this is called molcajete, and it's a special stone, you know, more like the stones that you find uh, close to volcanoes. Okay. So I just uh, boiled some uh, tomatoes, one onion and two chilies and I'm gonna make some salsa here. This is great to do uh, to accompany any, any of the dishes. And so this is very special for me to use the mocha fete. And so we have Tomato, one uh, half of onion and two chilies here, and I'm just going to uh, get one fresh. Here we go. Okay, and now just grind. And uh, also the molcajete is a, a project that we have in Mexico that um, is a food justice food decolonization project that is working in central Mexico and it's basically a food truck 
okay, that goes teaching people about our foods and the importance of that food and cooking with people and sharing stories and recipes. So this is done and I'm just gonna go here to see my my our gordita was put in there. So the gorditas are done. We're going to open it and usually they have a one part that is thinner than the other. So this is thicker part and this is the thinner part. Obviously I'm gonna use the thicker part to do the cut. This is it. I open all inside. So we should have a lot of space here. I'm gonna put a little bit of whack and beans. Two gorditas, bring them more tortillas. Look now a little bit like tostadas because they got to cook while I was there. Okay, okay. See? Stop. Put it there. Cantare. like it and I hope that you you know try it at home and I'll be in July 1 to 4 in Christchurch New Zealand at the conference like I say and uh, you know any any questions uh, I'll be very happy to to answer to you you know we'll talk more about the work in Mexico and we'll talk about uh, the intersections with other movements and causes and why it's very important to you know, talk about food justice, you know, in our work. So, thank you very much.